Greetings, greetings, travelers! Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. My name is Mike. Welcome to another video from Earthshine Education. Now, if you are new to our channel, please be sure to click the subscribe button and ring that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of our live streams or future videos. This video aims to answer and expand upon a simple question. What is a telescope? By the end of this show, you, the viewer, should be able to describe the history of the telescope, explain how optical telescopes function, identify the differences in optical telescope designs, and identify advantages and disadvantages to some of the designs that we're going to talk about. Now with all that said, let's get to it. A telescope is defined as an optical instrument designed to make distant objects appear nearer, containing an arrangement of lenses or curved mirrors and lenses by which the rays of light are collected and focused and the resulting image magnified. As a general statement, a telescope is usually held in position by a base or a tripod or sometimes they're even just mounted on pedestals that are cemented into the ground. Uh, one end is going to be pointing towards something in the distance, and a small protrusion, an eyepiece, uh, is going to be the place where you're going to put your eye to see something, hopefully, uh, see something that's probably extremely far away. But who invented the telescope? Are they all designed the same way? Let's investigate a little bit further. See if we can find out. Now we're going to travel back in time. The year is now 1608. An optician from the Netherlands named Hans Lippershey applied for a patent. Now this patent was for an invention that he called the looker. The looker had two lenses of different curvatures and focal lengths and it caused distant objects to appear much, much closer. His patent was denied. Now, news of this invention began to spread across Europe. Fast forward to the year 1609. That's a whole year later. Now, the news of this invention spread to Italy. In Pisa, there was a gentleman named Galileo Galilei, and he built a telescope solely based on the description of what Hans Lippershey was trying to patent. Galileo's telescope magnified slightly better than the Dutchman's, supposedly about three, three and a half times more magnification. Uh, than Lippershey's design. Galileo began steadily improving his design by creating better and better, higher quality lenses. Galileo then had a <laughs> stellar idea. What if this device was pointed at the sky? Beginning in 1609, Galileo began observing various celestial objects. He observed, and was credited for, discovering sunspots. Don't stare at the sun. Please never do this. It's a very, very bad idea. He discovered crater walls on the moon. Now, up until then, everybody just assumed the moon was one solid object and the color variation, yes, was there. But back then, people didn't know that, the, that those splotches on the moon, they were actually craters with surface depth. He discovered the phases of the planet Venus. Venus is closer to the sun than our planet Earth. 
And so from our point of view, it will actually go through phases. He discovered that in 1610. Also in 1610, he described the motion of four bright objects around the planet Jupiter. Today, collectively, we call them the Galilean moons, named for Galileo. They are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Also in 1610, Galileo described the rings of Saturn, though not how you would think. Because the quality of his telescope wasn't all that good, what he thought he saw was a three-body object. There were three things there when you looked at Saturn. Later, when he developed better lenses and improved his telescope again, Galileo looked once again at Saturn and actually was able to make out the rings with much better clarity. So, how do telescopes work? An optical telescope is a device designed to collect light from distant objects, focusing this light to magnify said object. The more light collected, the better and more detailed the distant objects will appear to you when you look through the telescope. The amount of light a telescope can collect is determined by its diameter. We call the diameter of a telescope its aperture. You may have heard the word aperture in reference to cameras where it, too, uh, refers to how big an opening is to allow light to pass through. thought I also heard about a company named Aperture Science once. Better buy a telescope. Want to see me? Buy a telescope. Want to be in space? That may have been a video game, though. But we're getting off track. Let's get back to the telescopes, shall we? Regardless of how light is collected and focused, light is magnified via an eyepiece, uh, which is where you're going to place your eye to see whatever is in the camera. Now, for imaging purposes, the eyepiece can be omitted and replaced with, at least in modern times, with a camera or a charged coupled device. In the past, before modern cameras were around, where the light would focus is where you'd actually put photographic paper uh, to take pictures of the sky. While there are many different designs for optical telescopes, and I mean many different designs, for simplicity, we are going to use three main classifications. Dioptric, or a refracting telescope. Catoptric, a reflecting telescope. Or catadioptric. Each category has their own advantages and disadvantages. We'll take a look at them all here in just a second. A refracting telescope, sometimes just straight up called a refractor, is a dioptric instrument using a lens to form an image. A lens is an optical device that focuses or disperses light by refraction. For a telescope, obviously, we want to have the light focused. We don't want to disperse light. Many people, including myself, also take advantage of this principle using lenses daily. We wear them as glasses to help correct our vision problems. Modern lenses can be made of plastic, while traditionally lenses were made of glass. The telescopes that Hans Lippershe invented and Galileo improved, as we mentioned before. They were glass lens refracting telescopes. There are some advantages to using a refracting telescope. Refractors have little to no maintenance. The optics are permanently aligned. The, once the lens is in the telescope body, that's it. It's mounted and that's where it stays. There's little to no maintenance. There's Long focal ratios for simpler eyepieces, so since the telescope will be very, very long, the eyepiece can be very, very simple. Simple design usually means less problems. There's also no reflections. You don't have to worry about light pathing as much. Uh, you also get superior performance in certain conditions. There are some disadvantages to using refractors. And uh, one of the biggest ones is the fact that there's a high initial cost. Lenses have to be designed with two well-designed and well-constructed sides. There's also the issue of what is called chromatic aberration. 
Uh, chromatic aberration is caused by the fact that light, when it's refracted, uh, the color components don't always focus in the same place. And so when they all do focus, the colors tend to bleed. You kind of see a bit of the rainbow of the object uh, surrounding it. So it reduces your image clarity. All right, let's talk about reflector telescopes. A reflector telescope, sometimes just call it a reflector, uh, is a telescope that utilizes a single or combination of curved mirrors to reflect light. Now, these can be referred to as catoptrics, which we mentioned earlier. Now, this derives itself from a Greek word, catoptron, which means mirror. The reflecting telescope uh, was invented in the 17th century by an English mathematician, physicist, astronomer, theologian, philosopher, and author. The person's name was Sir Isaac Newton. You may have heard of him. Look at that fabulous hair. Now, if you have not heard about him, it's quite all right. We're eventually going to be featuring Sir Isaac Newton uh, in a future video. So, again, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out when we do some of these uh, highlight videos on various scientists. Now, Newton established the concept of classical mechanics, shared credit with Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, who also had fabulous hair uh, for developing calculus, and he also made many contributions to the field of optics. Some reflector telescopes are also called Newtonian telescopes, named for Sir Isaac Newton because they are based on his design. Now, there are some advantages to using reflectors. Primarily, Low cost. Mirrors use only one reflective surface, so they're easier to construct. They're cheaper than lenses. There's fewer aberrations. Mirrors reflect all wavelengths of light equally, so there's no chromatic aberration. Mirrors also have less spherical aberration, which is the scattering of light which occurs when lenses aren't focused properly. So it's actually going to reduce that by using mirrors to reflect the light. And of course, there's a big difference in telescope sizes. Because mirrors can be made much larger and are more durable than lenses, uh, you can make really, really big mirrors which reflect a large amount of light, and that will, of course, improve your quality and detail uh, in your image, because you're collecting more light. There are, of course, disadvantages to the way reflectors work. Uh, and part of it one of those is a lack of mobility. Uh, some mirror telescopes, because you can make the mirror so big, well, make the telescope not movable. Because once they get over a certain size, they get really, really heavy. And all the other components of the telescope, the body, the eyepieces, uh, the tripod even, or the mount, they just become way too big and it becomes hard to transport. So a lot of the big professional observatories, large research observatories, for example, use one or multiple mirrors, uh, and they're all mounted, so they're just in one place. You have to pick a really good spot for your observatory, and that's where it's gonna stay forever. Big issue is also gonna be maintenance. Uh, because many of these mirror telescopes are gonna have open design, that means the mirror's gotta be cleaned often and inspected to make sure there's no scratches or you know large buildup of dust. As such, you have to also realign your mirrors often. Otherwise, you're going to get really, really rapid decline in quality. And kind of piggybacking off the last one we talked about with maintenance, uh, because the mirrors are going to be exposed to the atmosphere, you know, in the past, mirrors were coated with silver, and that tarnished over time. It's pretty much been eliminated nowadays. Modern mirrors use aluminum, but you still got to have them polished and replaced every now and then. Uh, so there is some extra maintenance involved in using a mirror. Finally, we get to catadioptric telescopes. Aside from being awkward to say, these are telescopes that are designed to take advantages of both refracting and reflecting telescopes. These telescopes utilize a combination optical system. There's a lens at the opening of the telescope, a secondary mirror embedded within that lens, a primary mirror at the back of the telescope. So you've got both refracting and reflecting working together. Catadioptric systems 
were used in the 1820s by French scientist Augustin Jean Fresnel for a lighthouse reflector, while Léon Foucault, also French, utilized catadioptrix for a microscope in 1859. In modern times, many telescopes in the market today uh, utilize a catadioptric design, particularly what are known as schmidt cassegrain designs. Again, there are many, many other designs out there, but we're going to briefly talk about the schmidt cassegrain Because he was French, I believe it would actually be, would be pronounced Laurent Cassegrain. Uh, he was a French Catholic priest. He designed a folded two-mirror reflecting telescope, but he had a hole in the middle of the primary mirror. This first appeared in 1672. We're looking at it from the side here, but I want you to imagine looking at a donut. Because that's pretty much what you got going on here. There's a hole right in the middle of the mirror. Fast forward to 1930. Bernhard Waldemar Schmidt, a Baltic German optician, developed the Schmidt camera or Schmidt telescope. It had a lens at the opening of the aperture and allowed for clearer, cleaner photos to be made of the sky. Jump forward 10 more years now, 1940. An American astronomer named James Gilbert Baker proposed a combination. Why not merge the Casagran design with the Schmidt camera? Now, the advantages of catadioptric telescopes, you get shorter and lighter telescopes overall. Because you are using a folded path optical system, you can design the telescope to be shorter in stature, shorter body, but still provide the image quality of a much larger aperture. This makes catadioptric telescopes more convenient. You can actually transport them easier because they're, you know, they are sizable, but they are still small enough that you can actually move them around in most cases. Spherical mirrors mean the lenses are easily designed. The primary mirrors of these particular telescopes can only be designed certain ways. That means that the corrector lens that has to be used at the front, they get to be more standardized and they're easier to produce that way. Easier production, of course, means lower cost, which then means a lower cost telescope in the end for both professional and amateur consumers alike. There are, of course, disadvantages to a CAD dioptric telescope. The biggest one, of course, being complexity and maintenance. With all the lenses and mirrors involved, these telescopes are far more complex. It means alignment and cleaning become paramount to keeping the telescope in top condition. Because you do have mirrors and lenses all combined, you also have a bit of an increase in weight. Now, I did say earlier that you can get them shorter and lighter, and that is true, but the corrector lens and all the mirrors involved can become very heavy when you get to very extremely large size telescopes. So there is both an advantage and disadvantage to this. There are some inherent optical limitations uh, due to the placement of the secondary mirror. This also exists in the Cassegrain and the Newtonian telescope design as well. So this isn't anything new, but depending on how big that secondary mirror is, you are reducing the amount of light that eventually gets to your primary mirror. Now, as we've seen, there is no one perfect design for a telescope. Each design compromises in some way. Many modern telescopes come with a small viewfinder attached. Uh, these small telescopes harken back to the original telescope design of Hans Lippershey all those years ago. Now, if you've never seen through a telescope, I do encourage you to check around in your local community. Some libraries have telescopes that can be reserved and checked out for a period of time. Just have to have a library card. There are, of course, community astronomy groups uh, or astronomical societies uh, that might be in your area that can provide the same sort of service where you can actually go and borrow a telescope if you're a member. Unfortunately, due to the current health situation around the country and frankly around the world, it's unlikely that what we like to call star parties, uh, large gatherings where a lot of people bring their telescopes and put them out in, you know, campgrounds or open fields and we all look at the sky together, that's probably not happening very often, or if at all, anytime soon. Good news is that there are still many observatories and observing groups that do live stream 
astronomical viewing on the internet via the internet. True, it's not the same experience, but with the power of the internet, uh, we are still able to share our love of astronomy with the world, and that's always a good thing. Well, that just about does it for this video. We set out with the following goals. The goals that you, the viewer, would be able to describe the history of a telescope. Yeah, we talked about that. Uh, explain how telescopes function. Yeah, we talked about that extensively. Identify the differences in telescope designs. Yep, we did that. Uh, and identify the advantages and disadvantages to telescope designs. Yep, we talked about that as well. Now, this was not supposed to be a graduate level optics and instruments class. Just wanted to be a nice, good, basic primer uh, for anybody that's got a passing interest in astronomy or telescopes, or for someone that's never looked through a telescope or never had the courage to even ask, how does this thing even work? It's okay to ask questions. Speaking of which, please be sure to post questions uh, in the comments section down below uh, or ask questions during our live shows. Yes, we do still do live shows when we're not, you know, spending our day scripting or editing videos. Uh, we still do try to do live shows. Uh, we're trying to stick to our Monday, Wednesday, Friday streaming schedule. Monday and Wednesdays, uh, we do live planetarium shows with question and answer sessions. Uh, those are available on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch.tv all at the same time. Uh, Fridays, we do what we call 3 o'clock coffee. That's just the name of the show. It's not the actual time, which might be confusing for some. Um, we do more of a news segment on those Fridays. Uh, it's more of a current events wrap up. Uh, what's going on in the world of astronomy? It's out of this world. Now, all of these shows are from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Mountain Time. So if you want to make sure you don't miss out, uh, please be sure to click the like button, the subscribe button, ring the notification bell here on YouTube and Facebook and over on twitch.tv. Uh, we've also got social media links. Uh, all of that is available in the description box down below. Please peruse them and follow them on your favorite uh, website or app of choice. If you found any value in this video, please consider helping out our channel by helping it grow. Share it with your friends or your family or in any sort of like you know, teacher group or school group, however you want to do it. If you're feeling generous, hey, some people do, uh, links to our coffee and Patreon pages are also in the description box down below. We do appreciate you sticking around to the end of this video. Please take care of yourselves and each other. Remember, astronomy's for everybody. May you have clear skies wherever you are. We'll see you in the next video.